Dear friends and comrades, dear members of the Chintaravi Foundation, uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm ashamed to say that I have not read any of Chinta's works because nothing so far has been translated into English and uh, Malayalam is not a language I speak unfortunately, though it sounds very lovely. Uh, so I'm honored to be here to speak on this subject in particular at this time. There was a view held by some, consciously or subconsciously, that once the Soviet Union collapsed and took the system down with it, and once China embarked on the capitalist road, somehow people felt without being able to articulate it that perhaps now imperialism would end too. And in fact, for the first four or five years after the collapse of these states or their transformation into something new, the word imperialism was no longer used. The word capitalism was used a great deal. And the triumph of capitalism after a 70-year battle with its enemies, and it was celebrated with euphoria in most parts of the Western world. But imperialism as a word, as a concept, declined. Now the interesting thing is that for the previous 70 years, the word capitalism was never used because even those who were strongly in favor of it felt that there was something sinister, something exploitative about capitalism. So they never used to acknowledge themselves as capitalists, they used to use the word freedom. It was never that they were fighting for capitalism, but that they were fighting for freedom. But with the collapse of communism, they then began to use the word capitalism more and more and more and now as you know it's, uh, it's uh, like a god worshipped and uh, with its allies, the free market so called, uh, with its main plank, the human rights campaigns so called. And so the word imperialism declined and if you ever raised it when they began to bomb Yugoslavia or when they were sanctioning Iraq. Uh, people would say, oh, you know, you people are dinosaurs, you can't get this word out of your system. To which I used to reply, it's not the word, it is the system. And that this system is now strong and powerful. Now, if you look at the history of previous empires, the European empires, that ruled large parts of the world from the 19th, late 18th century onwards, the way in which they did it was very open. They came to trade, they first sent in the companies, the East India Company from London which took India, the Dutch East India Company which took Indonesia, and many other similar smaller companies which began to start the search for trade and ended up having to defend that trade with weaponry and with the creation of armies. And that is how capitalism, expansionist or domestic, has always functioned. Today it's different. Today the project known as globalization is in effect nothing more and nothing less than a form of capital expansion, which has been taking place now for the last 30 years almost with uh, a, a big collapse in 2008, which I will discuss in a minute. But the European empires, how were they defeated? They were defeated by it, simultaneously by a two-pronged attack. The growth of nationalist movements in the colonies, of which this country is a major example, uh, the growth in those countries where no politics were permitted of national liberation struggles, armed struggles carried out by guerrilla movements in different parts of Southeast Asia. Some were victorious after a long struggle, some were crushed. And 
What we uh, uh, saw was the independence movements of the 50s into the 60s which created a new space in which countries came into being or new governments, new revolutions took place which made it clear that the hold of imperialism was now weak and the first world war destroyed the empires, the three big empires fell after the first world war, the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and most importantly the Tsarist Empire. The second world war basically made it impossible for the European powers to rule their colonies anymore. So you needed two world wars to destroy these uh, empires uh, and it was successful. The difference was this, that at the conclusion of the second world war, the European empires went into decline at the same time as the American capitalist system, which had by and large till then confined itself to its own hemisphere, this system suddenly received a tremendous boost because its economy flowered while the Soviet Union lay in ruins, having lost 30 million people, having defeated the Nazis, most of Western Europe lay in ruins. Traditionally, empires celebrate the fall of their enemies, even though these enemies are other empires. The United States did something different. It immediately targeted the Soviet Union and its allied states and the revolutions which were in the process of becoming, uh, um, achieving state power in China and Vietnam. And they realized that the main enemy was the communist movement and the national liberation movement. And in order to defeat this movement, you could no longer operate with rival capitalist powers in the same way as you used to. So they had to be built up again. This is the first important peculiarity of the American empire that it raised its capitalist rivals from the dust and made them into what they are. Without the Marshall Plan, without direct American occupation of Japan and Germany, West Germany, these countries would not be where they are. And they were given enormous privileges by the global capital, capitalist system to develop, which is why you had a big, big revival in Japan and in Germany. Once this revival had taken place, the U.S.'s position as the dominant power of the capitalist world, world was never under challenge. It could not be challenged. <clears throat> they were supported in most of their wars. Supported, but not necessarily with troops. And this is what the difference is now. That when the Americans fought the war in Vietnam for years, not a single Western European NATO country sent in troops. Australia did, South Korea did, but not a single European country. Why? Because they felt that to do so would be a huge provocation to the Soviet Union. They had to coexist with that world and they were not prepared to go all along the line. Once the Soviet Union collapsed, all European independence, real or token, disappeared with it. And Shashi mentioned Edward Snowden, the whistleblower. You can see in the way Western Europe reacted to him, how completely enthralled to the United States it is today using their power to stop this young kid who's done something very noble and honorable for the whole world, asylum. And more than that, you have an act of international piracy, behaving like pirates, gangsters, when the plane of the Bolivian president, on his way back from Moscow, is not allowed to go over Spain, Italy, France, he is forced to land in Austria. 
He has to wait 12 hours in transit in Austria while they give him permission to take off again. And uh, they insist on searching the plane. The Spanish arrive saying, we want to search the plane. To which the Bolivians say no. The Austrians say we want to clean the plane. Basically they want to see if Snowden is on board, which he isn't. So then the Bolivian president's plane is allowed to take off, which it does. They convene an immediate meeting of the anti-imperialist states in South America, denounce the United States. Bolivia threatens to break off relations with the United States. And the news today is that three countries, Bolivia, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, have offered immediate asylum and help to Edward Snowden. Compare that with India, which didn't even say we will consider the situation if we are asked for asylum. We will think about it. No. The minute the request comes, will you consider it? No, 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 not please. We are Indians. We are frightened now. You contrast this with the shift from the non-aligned status which India once used to have and for which it was respected throughout the world, especially the Arab world, by the way, with now total craven capitulation to the the imperial power that rules the world today. And they were not alone, they were with Europe. The Brazilian government did the same thing in South America, and today in Brazil, the largest newspaper, O Globo, has published a new release made possible by Snowden, which is that the United States was spying on every single Brazilian company and all the important Brazilian political parties for the last 10 years through this system. So you deny the guy who actually made this knowledge public a chance of asylum in your country. What can one do but hang one's head in shame that he did it? And thank God these South American countries exist with the conscience of the world today. Without them, there would be no resistance at all. Because the rise of the United States now is a twofold rise. One, it has no conf you know, conflicts with any of its principal rivals. It rules Europe. The European states can be divided into two types, vassal states and tributary states. Britain and Spain are total vassal states. The Germans are a tributary state. They pay tribute in different shapes and forms. The largest state, not happy, by the way, with what exists. So Europe as an independent entity does not exist today. The European Union is in, is in crisis, never could be uh, uh, take any uh, uh, political position which was conflictual with the United States. What about China? Because the two events of the, with that will mark the 21st century. One is the rise of the United States as the world's first and last global power. This has never happened in human history before, that one big power has dominated the world. People talk about the Roman Empire, but the Roman Empire, though it traveled widely, was largely a Mediterranean Empire. And they barely knew, the Romans barely knew the existence of China and what the Chinese Empire was, but knowledge didn't travel so uh, in, 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 in such a way. None of the other empires of the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th centuries were global empires. The United States is a global empire because of the way in which technology has developed, the way in which the technological revolution has transformed the world, and through concrete facts, there are today American military bases or a military presence in 190 countries of the world, big and small. That's almost more countries than our members of the United Nations. And this presence is very known about, it talks, 
The American president today has powers for the first time in American history to order the death of a U.S. citizen wherever and where uh, he or she is. So technically Obama has the powers to order a drone attack wherever Edward Snowden is staying to destroy him, legal in the United States, for the first time in history. Legal to spy on the rest of the world. No wonder that the Spiegel, the big German weekly magazine, said what we are witnessing in the United States under Obama is a form of soft totalitarianism. That is the harshest statement from a European magazine, which is part of the media system of uh, uh, Europe and the United States. So the Ger within Germany there is concern. The other reason for concern in Germany is this that for years the propaganda they made to their own people was look at the East German government. The worst crime of the German, East German secret police, the Stasi, in German political culture was that they spied on people. Can you believe it, they would say. They spy on their own people. And this was very dominant and that is why the reaction in Germany has been a bit stronger, saying this is worse than the Stasi, some people have said, because the surveillance is global. <clears throat> but effectively, in terms of politics and economics, there is no resistance. So the United States is positioned as the dominant empire, despite the fact that they don't always get their way, or they suffer setbacks. That is part of the history of empires. It's not when you say that this is a, a, a dominant and successful and the only empire in the world today, you don't by this mean that they get everything right, they don't make mistakes. Of course, all that goes without saying. But that they are dominant should not be doubted for a minute. You know, looking at the attitude of your country, for instance, the governments of your country, not the people. Uh, who would have thought that an Indian Prime Minister <clears throat> could say to the American President, and not Obama, but uh, George Bush, um, President Bush, the Indian people love you. I mean, there's an open question to what extent the Indian people love their Prime Minister, leave alone the American President. But never mind, the fact that these things are said in public <clears throat> is symbolic. It means that there's no real, he, he, he knows he can get away with it. And he does, he has. So it's astonishing that that happens and carries on happening in a country which has an honorable past on these issues uh, like India. So there is no doubt, militarily, the United States has more power today than the next six countries combined. They can destroy, they have the power to destroy the world. <clears throat> the way American soft power has penetrated the world, hegemony we used to call it in the nice old days of Gramsci, which of course, Chinta Ravi translated into Malayalam, very important thinker, probably one of the greatest thinkers produced by the European communist and left movements, Antonio Gramsci, who explained differences in tactics and strategy that were needed by analyzing the grip of the ruling class, which was not only economic, not only political, but also cultural. And that grip today U.S. hegemony is extremely strong. I mean, if you look at it in terms of literature, publishing, in terms of cinema, it has swept the world. I mean, the European cinema of the 40s, you look at the Italian social realists, the 40s and 50s, at the new wave in France typified by Godard, in the 60s and 70s, the rebirth of a new Italian wave, triggered off by the French new wave in the late 70s and the 80s, the German cinema that was produced slightly expressionist in tone but very brilliant 
typified by the films of Fassbinder, gone. Most of the stuff being made in Europe today, to put it politely, is rubbish. Mimicking Hollywood successes. What Bollywood has been doing for centuries, the Europeans have now caught up with. Thrillers, action flakes, we can do it better than Hollywood. <clears throat> and that is uh, what they are doing. And of course, this doesn't only apply to Europe. You know, by and large, the Indian cinematic tradition, which was very, very strong in the 50s and 60s and 70s, is, to put it mildly, on the decline. And so much so that even the language of that cinema is disappearing, is not being understood, is not being studied. I was once asked by The Guardian many years ago, who is your favorite filmmaker? And I said, it's a stupid question because there's not one single favorite. How can there ever be? And it's, it's a dumb, dumbing down question. I have many favorites. So, of course, <clears throat> I mentioned the great Japanese filmmakers, I mentioned uh, Shakyajit Rai and others from India. Finally, she said, okay, can we narrow this down? Who is your favorite European filmmaker? So I said, I suppose Bunuel, the great Spanish genius. And she said, excuse me, what was that name? <laughs> And I said, are you sure you work in the film section of The Guardian? She said, yeah. I said, and you haven't heard of Bunuel? That shows what trouble we're in. <laughs> but I'm saying this, you know, not to criticize The Guardian, a paper I really am fond of and write for, but to show how deep this goes. This malaise which is struck at culture, more or less globally, and made it what it is. And I haven't mentioned the great cinema of Brazil, which too has disappeared, which indicates that the flowering of the arts is not unrelated to what is going on in society at large. That for the 70 years of the Cold War, in order to show their communist enemies that the West was freer, had freedom of the press, was more democratic, which was, by the way, undeniable at the, in that particular period, a lot of space was created to, for people to do what they wanted to do. And some of this produced very high quality material in virtually every, every form. But with the collapse of the old enemy, they no longer feel the need to do it. So money is not given, state help of the arts is declined, the trust the market, the market will deliver, and we see that the, what the market basically delivers is not diversity, but the mimicking of success. If one film is successful, six other people will try and make that film again in six different ways, and then they are surprised that that isn't a big success. So the U.S. soft power has, or hegemony, has also dominated uh, the world as we see it. So that is what we have on one side. What do we have on the other side of the ledger? The second single most important event that has taken place in the 21st century is that the center of the capitalist world market, the center has shifted eastwards. And China today occupies a position which is analogous to the position that Britain occupied in the 19th century after the Industrial Revolution. The commodities made by British industry began to dominate the world. And that is today the case with China. You can hardly visit a country where Chinese goods aren't available. <clears throat> and the success of Chinese capitalism has, of course, astonished the globe. Not just astonished, but, you know, they, they have to deal with it. So, <clears throat> when dealing with China, the question of human rights disappears altogether. 
never raised by American presidents who bombed small countries in Europe or the Middle East, supposedly in the name of uh, human rights and democracy. In the case of China, they can't do that. They can't do that because this is a country which they have to deal with because they are dependent on it. Sometimes when I'm speaking in the United States, I am asked, what do you think of the American working class? And I reply, this is a simple question to answer these days because the bulk of the American working class is in China. <laughs> That's where the bulk of the commodities you consume <laughs> are being produced. And one of the reasons this is the case is of course because they are cheaper, as has traditionally been the case. Now what impact is China's eruption on the stage going to have? We don't know, to be perfectly honest. And when one doesn't know something, it's better to say it rather than come up with fake certainties. We don't know where this is, how this is going to end. What we do know is that this is a capitalism generated exclusively by the state. That the state has not given up control. Even, you know, is very insistent that many, many so-called private enterprises have a state sector in it. So they avoided all the consequences of the crash of 2008, the Wall Street crash, which affected most of well, large parts of uh, the world, especially every single country in the Western world. So the Chinese response to that has been it can never happen here. Let us wait and see. I'm not 100% sure about that. But what we are sure about is that the world's largest proletariat now exists in China. That the big shift which is taking place in China from the countryside to the towns is creating a gigantic working class and how this class, whether it will become a class, again to use a Gramscian metaphor, whether it will make the transition from being a class in itself to a class for itself remains to be seen. Difficult to do it if trade unions are not permitted. Difficult to do it if political parties are not permitted. Uh, but sometimes people can override these problems. So the rise of China certainly poses a challenge to American economic dominance. <clears throat> but does it pose a challenge to American political, ideological, cultural, military dominance? No. Nor do they want to. The Chinese, from their point of view, see and look at the collapse of the Soviet Union all the time. And they, many Chinese thinkers have said that one big reason for the collapse of the Soviet Union was that they began to mimic the United States military. That the rearmament they decreed was a total disaster socially and economically for their people and then left them politically bankrupt. They just didn't know what, they, what to do, so they capitulated, thinking that the West would help them out. And that didn't happen, and we are not going to make that same mistake by overspending on the military. We will only spend that that is enough to defend ourselves and our periphery from any threats from outside, which in my opinion is sensible because there's no way they can challenge the United States for dominance. Virtually impossible to do. So you have to use other methods, largely political, and social and economic where the uh, occasion rises. So these are the contours of the world as we see them today. What are the principal questions that arise? There's one question which dominates. It's never asked as in, in a blunt way, but it's an old question. And the question is, what is to be done? 
And I think what has to be done is to search for a socialist alternative, which is socialist not only economically, finding a way of functioning that doesn't allow the state to take over everything, but certainly for the state to take over the dominant industries, which are essential, in particular the utilities, for the welfare and the daily lives of the large majority of people who live on the planet. Why should profits be made by large corporations on basic necessities? Other things can be discussed, you know, telecommunications, all that is not an essential uh, commodity. But air, the, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the gas, the electricity we consume, the houses in which we live, why should these be at the mercy of a market which is based on profit? These are things that a state has to supply. And this debate, by the way, is now beginning again as you see the collapse of the neoliberal system and what it did in, uh, in Europe. You know, I don't know, many of you probably don't follow uh, European events closely. Four or five countries collapsed and had to be bailed out by the German banks. And the German banks had to bail them out because they were heavily committed in these countries. And the interest they are charging these countries for bailing them out is so huge that there is misery in most of these countries now. And I say this to those in India, politicians and ideologues, who think, I mean, I think everyone knows that the shine has gone off India, but people still haven't realized that the system which is constantly being promoted through the way in which the media functions. I mean, I have to say this here because I used to, you know, be come in and out of India a lot in the 60s and 70s, even in the 80s. Just seeing the decline in the quality of the Indian press shocks me. The, the Times of India rang me up a few years ago, will you write for us? I said, what about on, on pornography, on consumerism? What do you want me to write about? Because when I look at your paper, I just want to be sick. I don't want to write for it. And you know, it's not, I'm saying this not because I'm in South India, but the only paper left which reminds one of the tradition of journalism is the Hindu and frontline. I don't read the vernacular press because I can't, so I can't comment on them. But by and large what has happened and what is being shown on television non-stop, even in the news programs, is quite horrific. And what is the function of it? The function of it is part of this marketized world. Don't worry, be happy. <laughs> we'll keep making you happy as long as you read us and watch us. Escapism. It never works. It's collapsing in other parts of the world and is, is, is uh, being challenged. So I'm saying this because I'm in India now. That don't think that this system which is being mimicked by New Delhi <clears throat> And both of the main parties, Congress and the BJP, on the question of the economy and neoliberalism, there is no difference at all. And if India needs anything today, it needs a political movement and a political party on the South American model, which promises and delivers. A, B, C, D. This is what we will deliver if you elect us and then deliver it. Otherwise, you create a huge vacuum. And this vacuum that was created by the collapse of communism was not just a cultural, political, social vacuum, it was also a deeply psychological vacuum. People felt there was now nothing left which partially explains the huge rise in religiosity that we have seen all over the world. People who would never have looked at religious extremism seriously, intellectuals, politicians, now look towards it because some of them, people are driven towards it because they have nothing else on offer. So, when you look at what is happening now, you can see that what they are offering 
is nothing. You know, you look at what has happened in Egypt. You have an uprising, an uprising that sweeps the entire country, led by young and old and workers and intellectuals, and they get rid of one dictator, Hosni Mubarak. Then there's, of course, when you have mass uprisings, there are two possibilities. Either that a mass uprising will develop into a revolution and completely transform the system. That was never on the cards because no party and no group was able to do that. Fifty years ago, if you had had an uprising of this sort, at least some cities, Suez, Alexandria, possibly parts of Cairo, would have come under the grip of the masses and they would have set up alternative ways of governing and ruling. Didn't happen in Egypt, didn't happen in Greece, didn't happen in Portugal. Huge mass uprisings, but people don't know what to do. And when they don't want to know what to do, then the only way in order to bring about change is through elections. There is no alternative. And so they voted for the Muslim Brotherhood because they didn't want the old regime back in power. And then within a year, they have toppled that. Morsi regime, but with the help of the military, like Mubarak was got rid of with the help of the military. So what is the way forward there? I mean, I, I have these exchanges with Egyptian friends and comrades, and I said, there is no way out of it. You cannot ignore or run away from politics and political vacuums. Either you try and fill the vacuum or give up politics. You know, go and tend your back garden, grow vegetables, do whatever you do. If you want to fill the gap you, vacuum, you have to come up with political alternatives and once you come up with political alternatives, you need a political instrument which can fulfill these. And I said, look at the examples in country after country in South America, where you had mass movements which formed political parties, went to the elections, won, delivered on many of their promises, and have won respect throughout the world for what they did. So that is the only way. Otherwise, this cycle, this cycle will go on. Uprisings, the West says, okay, maybe we should intervene to get our own old colonies back in some shape or form. Iraqi oil is in the hands of the big corporations, once owned by the state. Libyan oil is about to be sold to big corporations, once controlled by the state. They want to do a similar operation in Iran, which is not going to be so easy because it has a different background and a different culture. But it's the chase there is after oil. You know, people say to me, sometimes I'm asked in the West, what is wrong with Islam? I said, nothing as such that isn't wrong with most other religions. But one thing I said is a sort of geological coincidence that in most of the countries occupied by Muslims, there's a huge amounts of oil. And I said, if these countries were occupied by Buddhists, Buddhism would be the religion with its problems. I mean, they have other problems, as we know. But looking at what's happening in Sri Lanka and uh, Burma and these places. But nonetheless, so it's the fact that Islam is coincidental in a way. If it had been Christianity, there would have been a fight with Eastern Christianity, uh, as there was once upon a time. So these are things and problems which are not going to uh, uh, go away. Now, given the crisis that took place in 2008, you would have thought that some of these mainstream left of center parties would have said, enough is enough. We can't do this, the state has to come back. By the way, as a footnote, the state never went away. The state was just used to push through these neoliberal uh, uh, economics and measures all over the world. It's not the case that the state uh, went away. Without the state, the capitalists wouldn't have got what they wanted. And I once said this, that. It's not just the bankers. You know, we can attack the bankers because it's good fun and they earn these astronomically huge salaries which are vulnerable to attack. Fine. But who gave the bankers 
the, 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 the space to do it. Who deregulated? The economy is the politicians, which is why something which we used to say was a special feature of the subcontinent, the symbiosis between politics and money. I mean, this goes a long way back in Pakistan and uh, in large parts of uh, India, that uh, money determined a great deal about who was elected, uh, who was uh, given money, who wasn't given money, etc. It still goes on, so I don't need to dwell too long on it. We know it. But this infection has now traveled the world. Every single European country has seen huge scandals of politicians being locked up for lying, politicians being accused of taking money, accused of taking bribes. So Europe feels like home now. I say, how can you? I mean, I attack corrupt politicians in the subcontinent all the time. I have been doing it for the last 40 years. But I said, you have no right to do it because you're like them. Why are you so worried about who's corrupt in India or Pakistan or etc.? Because your politicians are exactly the same. They have a sophisticated mask. That's all. Once you take the mask off, underneath it's exactly the same. All the politicians who help to privatize, bring private medicine in, etc., then later when they left office went and joined these firms. If you look at the number of British civil servants who were part of the defense industry, and just someone should do a survey, I'm sure they will, how many of them are now working for the arms industry? It's eye-opening, but not surprising. So this symbiosis between money and politics is now creating a situation in which democracy itself is under heavy pressure. It's being hollowed out. And what is the situation? The situation is this. You have, in my opinion now, in the so-called heartlands of democracy, a situation where an extreme center has been formed. This extreme center, and I call it an extreme center, in contradistinction to extreme left and extreme right. This is an extreme center. A center is meant to be moderate, but it isn't. No longer. And in this extreme center you encompasses center-left and center-right parties who, when they come to power, do exactly the same thing. They support America's wars, they carry out austerity measures, they denounce their own people, they defend everything that is indefensible. So then, if in these countries voting is becoming meaningless, which is what these young people out on the streets say, we, we, we spit on your politics. To be part of politics is to be tainted. It's a response to that. It's a wrong response because then you have to create something else like they have done in Greece and South America. But nonetheless, it is uh, something which, which can't be blocked anymore because it, it is, this might sound ironic, but ultimately the left might well have to defend democracy against its so-called avatars. Because we want it. We don't want to be, live in one-party states. And the last point I want to make to you today, because it's, it's relevant and we shouldn't forget it, the main reason for the big triumph of the American Empire was their victory in the 70-year Cold War. Why did this victory take place? How, did the, how and why did the Soviet Union collapse? Why did the Chinese decide to go down the capitalist road as is? And I think the reason for that largely is that from the late 20s onwards, possibly even before, any idea of democratic discussion and debate within the communist movement was obliterated. That's, that is the principal reason which I think has to be understood. 
And I say this as a Marxist. I've been a Marxist all my life. That, is, that was one of the joys of talking to Comrade Damodaran in the 70s at JNU in Delhi. He was so honest and said things which very few communist leaders were prepared to say at that time, and many of them still are, unfortunately. So, what was the problem? Of course, the central problem was that the revolutions took place in countries with no tradition of any democratic functioning. Tsarist Russia, China. But leaving that aside, there was a long tradition. And Lenin said himself many a time, I'm worried that if the German Revolution doesn't take place, we will be completely isolated and then this same bureaucracy that has run the Tsarist state will consume the Bolsheviks. And of course, bandwagon careerism is very common. Many of the most hostile opponents of the Bolsheviks joined the party after its victory and played appalling roles, by the way, inside. But this decision, taken not to allow dissenting voices, Within the framework of the revolution, parties who were prepared, who didn't agree with Bolsheviks' tactics, but generally agreed with the revolution, had a deadly, deafening logic. What was that? That once you do not allow other political parties to exist, the logic of that is that you wipe out dissent in your own ranks. So everything becomes completely monolithic. And that has been the, one of the big tragedies that has haunted the entire communist movement. And in many parts of what we used to call the third world, it tied in with local forms of functioning, that everyone was given a line. And the line came in the early days from Moscow, and an old Indian communist friend of my father's, they were members of the in party together in the 30s. He used to be sent sometimes to Moscow to get the line and he would come back and joke saying, I got the line in Moscow, but by the time I reached Tashkent, that line had broken and another line was in place. <laughs> and then by the time I reached Vladivostok to get a ship back, uh, which could finally get me to India, I heard from local communists that there was now a new line in place. So people who become dependent on a line being given in this way by some high command, actually, even though they do it subconsciously, have accepted a form of religion. They may be atheists, technically, and they are, but this style of operation is essentially religious. You don't pray before, <clears throat> you don't base yourself before a guru or a peer or a religious leader, you do it in front of a political leader. And the authority of the political leader that is established is such that any challenge is deemed treason, is deemed a betrayal, is deemed impermissible. That is the lesson to be learned. The main lesson to be learned from the collapse in Moscow and the shift in Beijing because if that is the system you run then people are scared to tell the truth. Then when there's a huge famine in China, unintentional I accept, caused by Mao's policies and local party members witnessing corpses mounting in their own villages sent back a message to the party leadership, no everything is under control. Well it isn't under bloody control. And you know it, so you lie. And because you're the only people in charge, no one else can say, help, because there are no institutions created in which you can say help. And that is what killed the communist movement, by the way. Because had they had democratic initiatives permitted from below, a lot of good advice might have come from surprising people in their countries. How to run the economy? What are the big mistakes that are being committed? How can the Central Committee decide, sitting in Moscow, how many buttons need to be produced by this giant outfit in Central Asia? How can you, without some feedback? 
Everything becomes arbitrary and bureaucratic. And that is the tradition that the South American leftists have broken from, by the way. Hugo Chavez said to me many a time, democracy is important for us, we will deepen it and we will make it so attractive that the capitalists and the imperialists in this world will not be able to take it, which is absolutely right, what they did. And I said, what if you lose? He said, if we lose, we lose. We will fight again. Because of one thing I'm confident that our enemies cannot do even a quarter of what we have achieved since we have been in power. So these are lessons to be learned. I mean, we live in bad times. We live in a time, if you like, when we have witnessed a historic defeat. Important to understand that and not imagine, or you know, like people who go to funerals and behave as if they're at a wedding, that to imagine that uh, what we have witnessed is something minor, the collapse of the Soviet Union for millions, even billions of people was who didn't appreciate the niceties of what I'm saying or what other critics have said, but saw it as a bulwark and as an old, in a vague sense as an alternative. That the wiping out of that demoralized people globally, and that is one reason why people are nervous about searching for alternatives. And that is why we have to be very clear in the alternatives we offer. And I have said very bluntly, including to intellectuals who have softened on this, that religion, whatever religion, actually doesn't offer an alternative. Religion plays an important part in the lives of the people. Without it, it wouldn't have existed in the case of the monotheistic religions for 2,000 years plus and in the case of non-monotheistic religion for several thousand years. It wouldn't have existed. Obviously, it plays some part. But if you say that that uh, uh, you know, Marx once is famous for saying religion is the opium of the people, but people never read what followed those lines. He said it's the opium of the people, but it's the sigh of the oppressed as well. They, they have hope in it because they don't see anything else. And that is, of course, remains true to this day. The danger comes when these ideas, religious ideas, are then transformed into some form of politics because spirituality then completely disappears. Like the Islamist party in Turkey today is in huge problems. Not because it is Islamist, though many Turks don't like that, but because the leader of this party, Erdogan, Rajiv Erdogan, is in the pocket of the building industry. <laughs> That's why he's hated. <laughs>